ओके Hello everyone, thank you for being given the opportunity to speak to you today. I am Claire Milligan, Product Manager at our Biofarm Roan, and today I would like to speak to you regarding the analysis of ochratoxin in wine using immunoaffinity cleanup. Wine in general is a complex area highlighted by the fact that people all over the world dedicate their life to learning more about it. Today, I would like to start by providing a short introduction covering what mycotoxins are, properties of ochratoxin, and the health effects of this mycotoxin. I will continue by looking at some world vitivinicultural statistics before providing an overview of current legislative levels. I will then continue by looking at challenges faced in the laboratory for looking at immune affinity products and how these can be used for sample cleanup prior to HPLC or LCMS detection. Mycotoxins are toxic secondary metabolites produced by fungus, commonly known as mold. They are produced under specific conditions of moisture and temperature and are generally associated with diseased or mouldy crops. However, not all fungi can produce mycotoxins. Even those with the ability to produce mycotoxins may not produce them all of the time. Growth of the mycotoxin depends on temperature, pH, humidity, and the presence of plant substrates. Fungi reproduce by spores, which can survive the most unfavorable conditions for a long time period. Depending on the definition used, most fungal toxins occur in families of chemically related metabolites. Some 300 to 400 compounds are now recognised as mycotoxins. Some are exploited for the antibiotic and pharmaceutical activities. Others are involved in disease interactions with plants or animals. The formation of mycotoxins depends on regional and seasonal environmental conditions such as food availability, moisture content in substrate and surrounding air, temperature, pH value and interaction with other fungus. Where conditions are right, fungi proliferate into colonies and mycotoxin levels become high. Mycotoxins can be divided into different groups due to their appearance at different stages between the development of the crop, harvest, storage and toxicity. Therefore, mycotoxin contamination can be separated into primary, secondary and carryover contamination. Primary contamination means that the commodity in the field is already infested by the fungus. Secondary contamination occurs during storage and carryover refers to a mouldy commodity being eaten by an animal which passes the toxin on in the form of eggs, milk and meat. Although there are many mycotoxins, only a few of them are regularly found in food and animal feedstuffs. Most mycotoxins are chemically stable, so they tend to survive storage and processing, even at extreme temperatures, such as freezing. Nevertheless, those that do occur in food have great impact on the health of humans and can cause significant economic losses in terms of plants and livestock. Today, I will be focusing on one particular mycotoxin. Ochratoxin and its occurrence in wine. In world trade, wine is an important beverage and ochratoxin present in it could represent a risk to the wine economy. In 2019, the statistical report of World Vitae Viniculture produced by the International Organisation of Vine and Wine estimated that approximately 78 million tonnes of grapes were produced in 2018, 57% of this intended for the production of wine. Reports on ochratoxin in wine reveal that occurrence of this mycotoxin is worldwide and that in general red wine can contain higher levels of this toxin than white or rosy wine. 
Ochotoxins are a group of mycotoxins that are produced by a number of aspergillus and penicillium molds. Ochotoxins favour warm and humid conditions, and this toxin is considered to be a storage mycotoxin. Ochotoxin A is the most prevalent and relevant toxin of this group, and is known to occur in a wide range of commodities, including cereals, coffee, cocoa, spices, dried fruits, licorice, herbs, tea, beer, and wine. Although mycotoxins produced by the fungi are toxic to the plant, the plant has the ability to protect itself against the mycotoxin by binding another molecule to the parent molecule. A modified mycotoxin is therefore a compound in which the parent mycotoxin has been chemically altered into a conjugated or structurally related form of the original mycotoxin. It is thought that some of the modified mycotoxins are just as toxic as the original parent mycotoxin, however they behave very different chemically and can be more complex to analyse. This group of mycotoxin also consists of ochotoxin B, ochotoxin C and methyl ochotoxin A, however their occurrence is not so widespread as ochotoxin A. The simultaneous appearance of ochotoxin A and C in wine was first reported in 1996 and research for these associated mycotoxins are on the increase. It should be noted that antibodies exhibit natural biological variability and therefore behave differently. This means that immune affinity columns from different manufacturers do not perform identically. Our biofarm products have been tested by several external companies and have been found to cross-react with known associated ochotoxin molecules. Ochotoxin has shown evidence of carcinogenicity in animals, although this has yet to be demonstrated in humans. However, the International Agency for Research on Cancer has classified this toxin as a possible human carcinogen. In addition, the toxin has been associated with Balkan endemic nephropathy and with urinary tract tumours. New data that has become available since the last EFSA assessment in 2006 suggests that ochotoxin A can be genotoxic by directly damaging the DNA. Experts also confirmed that it can be carcinogenic to the kidney. Experts therefore calculated a margin of exposure. This is a tool used by risk assessors to consider possible safety concerns arising from the presence in food and feed of substances which are both genotoxic and carcinogenic. In its previous opinion, EFSA established a total weekly intake based on toxicity and carcinogenicity to the kidney. Experts have now used a more conservative approach by calculating margin of exposure and concluded that there is a health concern for most consumer groups. EFSA's scientific advice will inform the European Commission in the ongoing discussion on maximum levels of ochotoxin in foodstuffs. In 2019, the statistical report of World Vitae Viniculture estimated that Globally, there were 7.4 million hectares under vine in 2018, destined for the production of wine, grapes or dried grapes. Five countries represent 50% of the world's vineyard, Italy, France and Spain, being the top wine producing countries by a significant margin. In 2019, Italy's wine production amounted to over 47 million hectolitres. Again in 2019, total volume of wine produced was estimated to be around 260 million hectolitres worldwide. Although global wine production has seen a net increase over the last two decades, the surface area covered by vineyards has decreased during that time period. This slide provides an overview of data, again from the statistical report of World Vitae Viniculture, showing the increase in sales by value and volume in the wine industry over a five-year period. As is shown in the table, the increase in value for sparkling wine has increased by 33% between 2014 and 2018, while the increase in the value of bottled wine was lower at 19%.
The growth in volume for sparkling wine over the same period was 29%, while the volume of bottled wine remained fairly constant, with only a 1% growth. Regulations are in place which outline the maximum residue limits for various contaminants, including those for aquatoxin. In 2005, the EU modified legislation regarding aquatoxin in wine and set a limit of 2 ppb. Information regarding this legislation can be located in Commission Regulation 123 from 2005, which amends Regulation 466 from 2001. Regulation EC number 315-93 lays down the community procedures for contaminants in food. This regulation defines a contaminant as a substance which is not intentionally added to food and which is present as a result of the production, manufacture, processing, packing, transport or holding of such food or as a result of environmental contamination. In addition, this regulation also makes certain provisions and states that a food containing a contaminant should not be placed on the market if it contains a level of contaminant which is considered to be unacceptable from the public health viewpoint. Examples from the EU Rapid Alert System for Food and Feed illustrate the potential health risks to consumers when mycotoxin levels exceed legislative levels. For example, two red wine samples were found to have exceeded the legislative levels set in 2005 with the potential to have these rejected. This is what manufacturers wish to avoid as rejections can be costly, ultimately highlighting the importance of accurate and reliable analysis. As a busy laboratory, you will typically be analysing a wide variety of samples that are presented in a vast array of forms. These will include solid samples like cereals, which could be classified as easy samples to analyse, However, they may also consist of more complex samples like animal feed or spice mixtures. However, wine is presented as a liquid. All of the mentioned samples, including wine, will contain other components other than the analyte of interest and may be a mix of carbohydrates, sugars, fats, salts, proteins and pigments. All of these components can result in what is referred to as sample matrix. Matrix can have a considerable effect on the way the analysis is conducted and the quality of the results obtained. Such effects are called matrix effects. So what ingredients are in wine that could cause sample matrix? This slide shows some ingredients which may be contained within your glass of wine. It goes without saying that the wine sample would contain grapes. However, there may also be a portion of the sample that contains grape juice in order to make the colour of the final wine more intense. Sugar will also be included as this can be added to increase the alcohol content. Yeast is another key ingredient which converts the sugars into alcohol. In addition, things like oak chips or certain spices like vanilla, cinnamon or cloves may also be included to add flavour to the wine. Many wines are not vegan or vegetarian, as fining agents such as egg whites or fish bladder may be used to remove sediments. Lastly, the wine may also contain tannins, which can either be found on the skin of the grape, or they can be added in order to balance the bitterness. In order to obtain good, reliable results consistently, Sample matrix resulting from the various components of the wine sample should be effectively removed. It is therefore necessary to ensure that a suitable sample extraction and cleanup methods are employed. The removal of any sample matrix will reduce any issues with blockages within the analytical detection system, which can ultimately lead to downtime when no samples are analysed. False positives, as positive samples are normally required to be reanalysed in order to results. This leads to an increase in analysis time and potentially a reduction in overall margin. Any results with high percentage RSD indicate poor accuracy and reproducibility and again would need to be reanalyzed. And finally, poor sensitivity. 
Sensitivity is important to ensure you're complying with legislative levels and to ensure that you're not reporting false negatives. There are several options available to laboratories analysing samples. First is to use direct injection or dilute and shoot methods. These are typically used prior to LCMS detection. However, it should be noted that these methods are the most basic form of cleanup and ultimately will still result in some matrix effect being observed, which will need to be corrected for by using isotopic labeled standards and potentially also matrix match standards. This not only increases cost of analysis, but can also increase the time for analysis. Solid phase columns are also typically used prior to LCMS detection. However, again, are considered as a basic form of cleanup and as a result are most commonly used for the analysis of simple commodities like certain cereal samples. However, they are not recommended for complex or highly pigmented samples or for any sample where the low LODs are required. If, however, an immune affinity cleanup method is used, methods are found to be highly specific as the mycotoxin of interest is isolated and concentrated in the sample. This makes the method particularly suitable for the analysis of wine at the required legislative level of 2 ppb. In addition, the immune affinity cleanup removes all interfering components from the sample, giving you added confidence in your analysis, which can ultimately help to reduce the number of samples reanalyzed. Our biofarm have been offering solutions to the mycotoxin industry for over 30 years. In fact, one of the first immune affinity columns in our product range was Ocraprep, which still remains as one of our top-selling immune affinity columns. Ocraprep is a single toxin immune affinity column that has an excellent reputation in the market due to being used in numerous collaborative trials, being referenced in official methods, and being routinely used and referenced in many publications. However, we also have another immune affinity column suitable for the detection of ochratoxin. This is our ochrone columns. The product comes in two different formats. One is a narrow format column, while the other is a wide format column. Both immune affinity columns contain monoclonal antibodies for the mycotoxin of interest. The sample is extracted and diluted accordingly before being applied to the column. Filtrate is passed slowly through the immune affinity column to allow sufficient time for the ochratoxin to bind to the antibody within the gel. The antibody isolates and concentrates the mycotoxin. The column is washed with water or a suitable buffer where any material that has not been bound to the antibody will be removed from the column. The final stage is elution where an appropriate solvent is passed through the column, breaking the bonds between the bound toxin and antibody releasing the ochratoxin ready for injection onto the system of choice for detection. It should, however, be noted that not all immune affinity columns behave in the same way. The performance of the immune affinity column very much depends on the antibodies, solvents and method used during extraction and the overall cleanup method utilised. Users should be aware of purchasing columns using price as a primary indicator, as cheaper, poorly performing columns can have an adverse effect on method performance and can consequently damage a laboratory's reputation. This slide highlights the difference between the products in our portfolio. The same antibody is used in three products, however the quantity of antibody that is used differs. As can be seen from the table, Ocraprep has the greatest capacity of 1000 nanogram and therefore contains the most antibody. The two Ocrogrone products have a lower capacity of 400 nanograms and therefore contain a lesser quantity of antibody in the gel. As a result, the Rhone columns are considered a budget line and would not be the products we would recommend to use if analysing for any of the Ocrotoxin associated metabolites. So how can column capacity be used to help you select the right immune affinity column? Firstly, our biofarm defined the capacity of a column as the amount of analyte in nanograms applied to the column which will result in a recovery of 70% or more. 
For the majority of immune affinity columns produced at our biofarm, we test the capacity of every batch during our QC process and results are recorded on the QC certificate. In plotting data in the form of amount of toxin recovered versus the amount of toxin applied to an immune affinity column, we would expect to see three distinct regions within the graph. The first would be the linear working range of the immune affinity column. The second area would be the variable region, which approaches the capacity of the column. The last area would be the plateau region, where capacity would be exceeded. These three areas can be seen clearly in the graph shown. When selecting a product, it's important to know the capacity of the column to ensure that it fits with the method that you're working with and to ensure that you will be in the linear working range of the column. In validating a method, analysts generally spike samples at half the legislative level and double the legislative level. In order to obtain good results from an immune infinity column, you need to ensure that you're working within the linear working range, and we would recommend that you should aim to apply a sample equivalent corresponding to the maximum level of toxin and still be under the capacity of the column by about 30%. Applying a sample within the linear working range of the immune affinity column will lead to highest accuracy in the results obtained. If you take Ocarone as an example, the capacity of this product is 400 nanograms. This is illustrated at the top of the image by the red line. The green line in the middle of the image indicates the legislative level. For wine, this is a 2 ppb level. We would then analyse spiked samples at 4 ppb, i.e. double the legislative level, 2 ppb, 1 ppb, i.e. half the legislative level, and perhaps also at 0 0.4 ppb it should be around LOQ level. As can be seen in the image, the capacity would be significantly greater than the highest level that you're spiking at and would allow for a margin of error. This would mean that if you experienced results that were highly contaminated and greater than the maximum legislative level, you would still be within the linear working range of the column and you would not need to reanalyze samples and results would not be underreported as capacity of the column had not been reached. In addition, if more samples apply to the immune affinity column in order to achieve desired LOD and LOQ, there's plenty of room to allow for this modification in the method while still ensuring you're working within the linear working range of the immune affinity column. Although the Ocarone immune affinity columns are considered to be budget columns, there's still more than enough antibody in the product to ensure that accurate results are achieved. In fact, the Rhone columns often have a higher capacity than some of the competitor columns in the market. A higher capacity column essentially can reduce the number of reanalysis carried out, reducing the workload and prevent any modifications being carried out. What is the method that we recommend to use for the analysis of wine? Ocotoxin is moderately soluble in polar organic solvents such as methanol and acetonitrile. However, for the analysis of wine, the sample can be easily diluted with phosphate buffered serine. If required, the pH of the sample should be adjusted to a neutral pH before filtering and applying to the immune affinity column. The column is then washed with PBS to remove any interfering components that may be present prior to elution with solvent. The area is then diluted with water before injection onto the detector of choice. The method outlined is fast, simple and cost effective. The method detailed in the last slide was used to compare our two immune affinity columns, Ocoprep and Ocrorone wide, to determine the performance and suitability for detection of ocotoxin in wine at the legislative level of 2 ppb. Eight blank wine samples that had been produced from different grapes and different countries were taken and spiked. Samples were analysed using the two different immune affinity columns and accuracy and precision were determined. In all cases, performance of the columns exceed accuracy and precision criteria as set by EC Regulation 401 from 2006, with recoveries lying well within the accepted range of 70 to 110%.
In addition, results between both immune affinity columns compare well, demonstrating that both are suitable for the analysis of wine at legislative levels. This slide contains some example chromatography obtained using both columns. As can be seen from the images, nice clean chromatograms are obtained demonstrating that both products were able to remove interfering components from the sample and concentrate the toxin, allowing accurate detection at the low legislative levels required. At our Biofarm, we have been offering solutions to the mycotoxin industry for over 30 years and have excellent knowledge in-house in working with a vast array of samples. We have a dedicated technical services team to assist with method development and support when required. I would therefore like to introduce you to Michael Norris, who is one of our technical services scientists. He has been working with a range of samples for the detection of aquatoxin, including wine, and we'd like to share some of his feedback during the following video. Many thanks for taking the time to speak to me today, Michael. Can you tell me about some of the work that you're doing recently regarding wine analysis? Hi, yes. So um, every year around March, we participate in a proficiency test round uh, for the analysis of ochratoxin A in red wine, organised by the Spanish National uh, Reference Laboratory. Um, so what happens is three samples of red wine are sent to us. Uh, they contain an unknown co to us concentration of ochratoxin A and uh, they have to be extracted in duplicate. So the format of the trial really tests the methods accuracy and repeatability. Um, so we've been taking part in that round for about uh, 10 years and last year we got a Z score of 0 0.6 so it really works well. Um, I've also recently uh, conducted a project investigating how our methods and immune affinity columns perform um, on a variety of different wines from different countries. Uh, so every wine that we tested um, gave results well within the sort of acceptance criteria for um, analytical methods given by the EU regulations. And I think the perception is that wine is a very easy anal like to analyse by immune affinity columns. Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I would agree. So um, wine is definitely one of the easier commodities to analyse that we do with an immune affinity column. So the extraction barely uses any equipment. Um, and there's only a few steps involved, like pH adjustment and dilution. So it's uh, really quick and simple to do. The reagent preparation is really simple, as it's only PBS and acidified methanol that you need to make up. Um, and the sample cleanup is always really good, which makes the data analysis side of things really, really simple, because you've only got one peak to analyse. What pitfalls might you come across when analysing wine, and how would you overcome these? Yeah, so I think the main issue with wine is the pH. So the pH of wines I've tested always seems to be around pH 3 to 4. Um, so if you were to load that onto the amino affinity column without dilution or pH adjustment, you would risk denaturing the antibodies and the toxin accidentally eluting into waste. Um, so the PBS dilution that we do isn't usually enough to neutralise the, the pH of the wine. Uh, so we adjust it with um, five molar sodium hydroxide, um, which is quite strong, but it means that uh, you use less volume. So there's res less risk of um, over diluting your sample. Yeah. Um, so precipitation is quite often an issue with wine too. Um, sometimes after you dilute, a precipitate can, have, can form. Um, it's quite easy to overcome this though with centrifugation makes a little pellet at the bottom basically and removes all the solids. Um, wine obviously has quite a lot of interfering compounds, so um, red wine, for example, stains the gel of the immune affinity column. Um, so you can remove this mostly by using 10% between 20 and PBS, which is quite a strong wash, but it removes all of that colour. Um, during elution, though, um, the colour can still leach into the eluate, um, but as long as it's clear, the chromatography should be fine. Um, when you're eluting with just methanol um, with uh, red wine, you can quite often get a turbid uh, final eluate, but you can um, basically prevent this with a syringe filter. Thanks for those handy tips, Michael. Do you think there is an interest to analyse other mycotoxins in wine? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think many papers agree that aflatoxins and fumonazins are of particular concern after ochratoxin A. Um, 
also the presence of I think T2 is becoming more more common. Um, Patchulin is rare, but I think still worth monitoring. Yeah. Okay. Well, many thanks for your time today, Michael, and Great. hopefully thanks. I will see you soon. Great. Thank you. Bye. Most official regulations and control methods are based on high performance liquid techniques, for example, HPLC through international bodies. The analysis of wine, there are two official methods, AOAC official method 2001.01 and EN14133. Although the methods are over 10 years old, they are still valid today. In both methods, there is a stipulation with regards to immune affinity columns. They state that the columns should contain antibodies raised against ochratoxin A, and that the columns should have a total capacity of not less than 100 nanograms of ochratoxin A, and should give a recovery of not less than 85% when a diluted wine solution containing 100 nanograms of ochratoxin A is applied. Both the ochraprep and ochrarone immune affinity columns meet these criteria. In both of these methods, samples are extracted from sodium hydrogen carbonate which will help to ensure a pH close to 7.4, as wine is naturally acidic. These methods are also suitable for use in conjunction with our immune affinity columns, and many of our ochratoxin methods also use sodium hydrogen carbonate extraction. Is your lab faced with increasing time pressures for mycotoxin analysis? Is there a need to increase sample throughput in your lab without increasing costs? Is there a need to comply with strict accreditation specifications or to improve quality and reliability of results? Is standardization becoming more important to your organization to enable sharing of methods and data between sites? The solution is the Redar Crest system in combination with Immunoprev Online reusable cartridges. Together they provide an automated, cost-effective system for mycotoxin analysis. This increases sample processing capacity, whilst improving accuracy and reliability of results. This also leads to improved sensitivity, reproducibility and standardization of methods. Redarcrest offers a fully automated system, which handles two Immunoprep Online Immunoaffinity cartridges simultaneously. For the analysis of a sample, a cartridge is automatically transferred from the tray and placed in the left clamp of the system where the cartridge is conditioned with loading buffer before the sample is applied. The sample is then transferred from a vial in the auto sampler using the HPD syringe and is passed through the cartridge at a defined flow rate. The cartridge is washed using the HPD syringe and unbound material is removed from the cartridge and from the cartridge to waste. The cartridge is then moved from the left to the right clamp and is switched online with the analytical column. The toxins are eluted from the cartridge and the data acquisition starts automatically. The cartridge is then washed with loading buffer before being returned to the tray for reuse. During the elution of the first sample, a second sample is loaded simultaneously through another cartridge in the left-hand clamp. Improved productivity provides a faster result for your customer. Increased efficiency and workflow save time, labor and overall costs. Reusability of cartridges reduces waste and lowers storage and transport costs. And automation improves standardization of results for better decisions the first time around at any location. Immunoprep Online and Redacrest – improving quality of analysis through automation. Would you like to know more? Contact us to schedule a meeting. As illustrated in the video, many global laboratories are moving towards automation to improve throughput and efficiency between sites. There has also been a trend to standardise and harmonise methods and equipment across groups to make it easier to develop and exchange methods and to share results. In addition, many laboratories are investing in automated solutions to help manage increased sample numbers. Many of these labs are working with complex food matrices with low detection levels required, but they still need to use affinity cleanup. Our automated solution employs immune affinity columns, 
should be available in a reusable cartridge format used in conjunction with an automated handling system which is connected to the detector of your choice. The sample is extracted and the filtered extract loaded into an autosampler vial. Thereafter, loading onto the Infinity cartridge, washing and elution are fully automated prior to injection into the LC system. The software drives the unattended automated analysis. The same cartridge can be used up to 15 times. There are many benefits to automated analysis, including technical, cost and time-saving benefits. As there are fewer steps during sample cleanup, it has been estimated by a private lab currently using the automated system for mycotoxin analysis, a time saving of 23 minutes per sample is achieved. This results in an increased capacity in the lab and in sample throughput. A saving of approximately 25 hours a week can be achieved, freeing up time to spend on other complex projects. Automation also improves reproducibility by accurately loading the sample volume onto the cartridge. The automated system applies the sample, wash buffer and elution solution to the immune affinity cartridge using a defined flow rate and time ensuring that all samples are run in exactly the same way. This results in improvement in percentage RST. In addition, as analysis is automated, improvements to quality control are observed and the number of samples that have to be reanalyzed re increases. Lastly, I would like to highlight a number of publications that reference the use of the new affinity columns for the analysis of wine, as they may be of interest to you for further information. I would like to finish today by introducing the marketing and technical support team at our biofarm who have made it possible to host this today. We have Carol Donnelly, our Marketing Manager, Elizabeth Manning, our International Sales and Business Development Manager, responsible for the automated affinity cartridge business. Myself, Claire Milligan, the Product Manager for our immune affinity products. Victoria Jordan, UK Sales Support Manager, and our two marketing assistants, Jane Hogarth and Melissa Herity. Joyce Wilcox, Naomi Mackay, Michael Norris and Chris Mayer provide the data that we reported today. As a team, we work hard in being able to support all our customers worldwide, either in the field, from the office in Glasgow, or remotely from our homes during this current situation. I'd like to conclude today by saying that our biofarm will continue to be instrumental in developments within the mycotoxin industry, and will continue to work with our customers to enable product development in this critical area of analysis. If you'd like further information on anything discussed here today, or would like assistance in selecting the right product for your requirements, please do not hesitate in contacting us. Many thanks for your time today. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me and my contact details will be shown at the end here. Again, thank you for your time.